Okay, so if I may introduce myself before we start, it's great to see so many of you here. So the reason that I am so passionate about this, this topic is um, because of my background. So I started making soaps in my kitchen, um, and I was a very broke single mum at the time, and I ended up running what became the largest handmade soap company in the UK. Um, I managed to sell products within 18 months. I'd managed to get listed in every major supermarket in the UK, and also stores like Harrods and House of Fraser and Fortnum and Masons. Now, in a previous career, I'd, I'd started a knitwear company, and I'd sold my designs to Saks Fifth Avenue and Nordstrom and Henry Bendels and numerous others. So I'm, I'm a pretty old hand at this game of opening doors. These days, I live in, in the south of France, which is very nice with my poodle, Doris. And um, I run VIP coaching programs. And I also run a skincare business masterclass. And over the last 15 years, I've coached over 150 new brand owners on how to build their brands, taking them right from the initial idea through to international distribution. Now, some of them are running multi-million dollar companies now, and some of them are not, and many are on the road. Um, and I think the difference between me and most industry coaches is that I've actually traveled the journey you're on, and I know where the potholes are because during that journey, I fell in most of them. Okay. Now, I want to make sure that that doesn't happen to you. And at the end of the day, however much whatever passion you feel for your skincare or for your mission as a whole, if you can't sell it, you haven't got a business. It's, it's as simple as that. Now, I'm going to go through each of these slides that I'm showing you is probably a webinar all on its own. So many of you I know when you set out, your plan is you, you probably started with a passion for skincare, or soap or whatever, and you've started making your products at home, and perhaps you've envisaged a hobby, a hobby type business, or you're one of the entrepreneurs that I like to work with, and you really understand that um, it takes as much effort to think big as it does to think small. So I do like big thinkers. And but the question you've probably decided that your easiest route to market is to make products and sell them online via, via a website or via some of the online portals. And that's, that's fine. But the point is that the high street isn't dead. And despite all the press and all the stores that are closing down, and you need to understand that selling to retail, if you want to build a big business, is not only um, a, 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 a a choice it's actually a must because um it gives you the exposure you need and the positioning for your brand it also helps you enormously because it gives you bulk sales i mean online you're selling one one at a time maybe three at a time and retail gives you a more predictable income um and it gives you a chance to uh build a really good relationship with key players it also helps your cash flow because you can gauge after the first few months who is ordering in what volumes, how often they're repeating, um, and you can keep a steady flow of income, albeit at a lower margin, but it really is part of the mix when you're trying to build a solid business. And finally, if you get into key stores, and I say key stores, we're going to talk a lot more about that later. But key stores, your presence in a key store is your perfect entree to export. And export is ultimately where the money is, especially if, if you're in the UK or Europe. Now, this is the state most of my clients are when they come to me. He's sweet, isn't he? But they're worried. They're worried about. Um, they're worried about being in an industry that they don't fully understand. 
They're worried about the amount of money that they have to invest to create a, a great marketing presentation, to create um, their products, to do all the legals, to do all the things that's necessary. It's a big investment. And they come to me because they want to do it the right way and because they know that I will pick them up on, on any mistakes that they make along the way. But I am real testament to the fact that this is totally possible. You can start a business with nothing. You can get key stores to buy you, but you have to be totally prepared in order to do so. Because if you get yourself a meeting at a store like Harrods, for example, you will only get one meeting. And if you fluff it, you fluffed it. Now, there is a lot to be happy about, as this fellow will tell you. The worldwide skincare market is projected to reach US dollars 183.3 billion by 2025. So there's all those people out there that are still desperately trying to be beautiful and healthy and look 100 years younger than they actually are. Now, natural skincare products are expected to be the largest growth sector within this market. And the sale of organic skincare products is anticipated to reach 21 billion by 2024. Now, that is what you call a bullish market. So it certainly can be done, and it's the right time to do it. Your big, huge, massive issue is that everybody wants a piece of this cake. And there is so much competition out there that with every step you take, you've got to be absolutely sure that you're ahead of the game. So how are you going to do that? We've got our range. And hopefully you've, um, if you certainly if you've worked with me or if you've, if you've uh, even if you're on my forum, I think, um, you will have covered the absolute basics. And I would have expected most of you to do enough research to know that you've got to identify your niche, you've got to identify your ideal client, you've got to brand professionally, your products have to be ace, wonderful, perfect, natural, if you're making them yourself or if you're going to a contract manufacturer. And I'm assuming that if you're thinking about selling to retail, then you already have those sort of basics reasonably sorted out or you do know what you've got to do. But the key, key way to success is that you've got to be original. You've got to meet a need. You've got to have a great marketing plan. And you've got to have a realistic budget. You can bootstrap. All my clients are encouraged to bootstrap. But ultimately, this business, to do it properly, your formulations, um, the fact that most of your suppliers are asking for large quantity orders means that you've got to have a realistic budget. And this is even more so once you get out in the big wide world and you start selling, because these days a lot of stores are struggling and they're really working on selling shelf space. And they do that by almost insisting that you get involved in various promotions that they're launching and that you pay for those promotions. So a realistic budget is necessary. You also need to offer your store really good profit margins. So 50% is absolutely bottom line these days. And the more that you can offer the more likely you are to make the sale. These are, these are the hard facts. I'd love to tell you that you can just go in and seduce a buyer, but you're going to learn a little bit later in this presentation that it's actually about being highly professional. And if you're, if you're prepared before you go in and you've got your costing sorted out and your margins have been included in that costing, you want to go in in a position to offer your retailers a really good reason to partner with you. You also need to be totally and completely professional in all your dealings because the store buyers need to know that you're as good as your word, that if they buy off you, you can deliver in a timely and proper way. Um, and 
you can have a wonderful romantic story behind your brand, but if you don't have that underlying professional edge, you're not going to get into the big players. And that's what you're going to end up screaming at me. So your first step to success is to ensure that you're retail ready. And that very much includes your mindset. Um, that really does include your mindset. And I'll just give you a little example of this. A lot of people feel they feel really, you know, they, they, they love the creative bit. They've got their branding sorted out. Um, their products are wonderful. They know they're wonderful. But when it comes to thinking about selling, they're absolutely, um, it really touches on a nerve. And they start questioning themselves. Is my brand good enough? Can I compete with the competition? Am I charging too much? Um, all these questions just flood in. How can I ask people to actually pay for my products is the underlying fear. Um, and the truth is that if you go into a store believing that you have a great range, you are halfway there. And what you're doing when you're selling is not asking people to give you money cap in hand for your product, what you're doing is giving people the opportunity to buy your wonderful products. And you need to pin that up on a, on a, on a stick it note somewhere. My products are worth what I'm charging for them <laughs> because that really is one of the, the mindset pieces are the biggest stumbling blocks. The other issue that people get scared about is that in most cases you might be a one or two person organization um, and it's really important that you have a vision before you approach a store of where you're going to be in five years time and you act as if you're already there. So um, your buyer doesn't want to hear that you've got a dream. They want to hear that you've got a business. So these are the critical things that you've got to look at before you approach a buyer. You've got to consider your branding. Now, when you're branding just to sell online, that's fine. You can do what you like, providing it expresses the mood and the, and the, the market that you want to go to. But when you're selling to retail, you've got other things to consider. You've got to think about whether your branding will stand out on a shelf and how it's going to look next to everybody else's branding. Now, there are some store groups out, out there, stores like Liberty, who often select their seasonal categories according to the look of the brand. And it's very interesting to wander around there because you might find that one season – everything looks very clinical and white and the next season everything's exploding with fruit and looks like it's come out of a calypso. So branding is to some degree a fashion. So it's often really good to be minimal as many brands are today but it has to stand out on a shelf. So if it's pale blue writing over a pale pink background it's lost. The other question you've got to ask yourself is, is your packaging adequate? So is it going to stack on pallets? Um, is it going to survive being shipped in boxes or is it going to break? Um, is it going to survive being picked up and handled by the consumer? Um, if it stacks, all the better. I know some products don't, but if they're in boxes, they will stack on the shelf. And is it durable? Really, really important, really important consideration directly related to selling to retail. The next really key issue is will your costings give you the margins you need so that you can offer your retailers a good profit? Now, um, at the beginning, you're going to feel like you'll take anything for your products when you first go out there and sell. If someone offers you money, you're going to want to grab it. You're going to want to do a deal. 
But it's really, really important that right from the start, you have taken into account all the margins that are going to come into play as you scale. So you might need warehousing. Um, there will be all sorts of logistical extras that are going to make demands on your money. Your marketing budget will increase. Now, provided you've taken all these things into account right from the start, then you're going to be in a pretty good position to negotiate your sales to retailers. So I'm really just going back on what I hope you already know before you're even thinking about going out and trying to sell. Now, the other key issue is, are you clear about your unique selling proposition? And this is so, so important. I'm giving you a mini course on this page. But um, it's really important to be special to a few people rather than to be average to, to, to everybody. So you need to know and be able to communicate to a buyer why people will buy your products. You've got to know your numbers. Again, this comes with your costings. What discounts can you offer? Absolutely everybody wants a deal of some kind. And if you go to a store like Harrods, there will be um, discounts for a particular, being listed in a particular department. There will be discounts for uh, perhaps wanting to negotiate the, their payment terms. Um, there will be discounts for um, them collecting from you rather than you delivering. There's all sorts of things that you are going to need to offer discounts for. And once again, if you've taken this into account in your costing spreadsheet right at the beginning, these will be doable. And the other thing that you need to know before you approach um, a retailer is what your pack sizes are. Now, when you're selling wholesale or you're selling direct to stores, you don't sell by the unit, you sell by the pack. And your pack size, to some degree, depends on the end value of your product. So you might sell in packs of sixes and you might sell in packs of 12. It really depends on the value and, and your positioning in the market. So, see, I've got to skim over some of this because these are quite in-depth questions that you have to explore and ask yourself. It's also really, really easy when you go into a store to have an introductory offer or a starter pack already worked out so that your buyer um, can buy a range of your products at a certain price. And that range needs to be big enough. So let's say you've got five products and you might, your starter pack might consist of um, one case of each product, or it might be, then there might be a, a, a more advanced um, option where you're offering two cases of e each product and free shipping. Um, so you need to be prepared and have an offer that is easy to buy because right at the beginning of your journey, you don't want to be in a position where your buyer is saying to you, well, what are your best sellers and asking you for numbers and you don't have any. So this way you're covering that scenario. And the next question is retail obviously has um, uh, lots of possibilities. So according to your size and the amount of product that you can produce, and the time scales you need in order to produce it, um, you really um, you you really want to know um, which stores you should approach. Okay, so as a as a startup, you might want to approach small independent retailers, and it's certainly a good idea for you to. Um, to start with small stores just so that you get into the habit of making a presentation and um, actually um, seeing way, what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. So you don't want to go for the big boys first and then, then blow it. Now also larger stores, I'll go back to the consignment thing, but larger stores really want to see a track record. So before you think about approaching stores like Harrods or Saks or, or whatever, 
it's really critical these days that you have built a really strong online presence because many of these store buyers these days take their lead from um, what's on what's online. They're really looking at your Instagram account and they want to see large numbers following you. And this is really quite easy for you to do. You might need help doing it. Um, I would advise everybody that hasn't done so and isn't totally familiar to take a social media course. But you want to build um, a track record so that you have something to show. And we cover quite an interesting angle to this the other day in a workshop that I was doing, in that these days it's actually possible for you to write, uh, this is aimed at people that don't have a track record yet. Um, so, for example, one of my clients is doing um, a range of products based on weeds. She's taking her, using weeds as her key ingredient. And we were talking about her actually writing a short book on weeds and getting it listed on Amazon. And there are ways that you can create a bestseller on Amazon in your category. And what this does is create awareness for your brand, but also gives you the credibility to go into a store and say you've got a bestseller on your topic. So that's just something. There are tricks that can make you look more credible than you're actually feeling you are. And that's really just one of them. Um, you could look at um, big store chains and supermarkets and the Bootses and the Walgraves of this world. And many of them will be happy to take you on, but they will want to try initially to sell you on their, on, online only. So what they do is they list you online, and then if, if that works out well, they'll take you into store. For those of you that were considering starting off selling at markets, um, if you're selling high-cost high products, this is going to damage your reputation and your positioning. So it's fine to sell on markets while you're testing out your products and you want to see whether people like your branding or, or how they're reacting to them. But really, um, it's not a good idea if you want to create a credible brand. Pop-up shops are a great option for beginners because they give you control. Um, you are getting the full retail markup, less whatever commission you're paying to the pop-up shop. Um, and you're also in control of how you sell. So that's a good experience for people. And there are more and more great pop-up shops and great locations coming, coming around all the time. But in the initial stages of selling, you really should consider it as a marketing exercise. It's about exposure, not necessarily. So obviously, you want to make a great financial return. But that should be secondary. Initially, your place out there in the, in the high street is about creating awareness of your brand, okay? Um, so whichever type of store you pick and you want to approach, it needs to reflect your brand positioning. And if you're going to go for small stores, don't just think about the obvious skincare retailers. Think about partnering with florists. I mean, there was an Australian brand that used to have um, uh, little stands of their face masks in bookshops. They had it everywhere. So look at fashion stores. Um, approach fashion stores and see if they want to partner with you with the branding. Um, partnerships are great. And if you can actually marry up with companies that already have a reputation and a great track record for selling, that's going to be really good for you. Now, the most critical thing you have to do before you approach a key re retailer is your research. You need to know, so let's just say that you decided that you wanted to approach Nordstrom. I'm going to use Nordstrom here because I know that Sheila, my Sheila Wellgreen, is, is, is listening to this. And Sheila actually approached um, Nordstrom. And 
one of the things that she did, and this is what I would advise all of you to do, is she went to the store and she spent about an hour in the department watching the customers come and go and watching which products they picked up um, and generally sussing out the age group and what they were interested in. And you really, really, before you approach a key store, you need to know that store like you know your own home. You need to find out what their current focus is because stores always have an agenda from year to year. It might be that they want to attract a younger clientele. It might be that, they, um, that they're focusing on green products. It might be that they want to focus on pro-aging. If you're in a store, talk to the assistant. See if you can suss out what it is they're trying to do that season with their skincare or generally with the store and the store clientele. The other way to find out is to look at the um, various retail trade magazines, look at shows that um, retailers have spoken at, and you can get a feel that way. You can key up with buyers on LinkedIn and ask the question, but it's important for you to understand what the focus of the store is. You also need to be clear on what brands they currently stock because that will give you a good feel. You'll find out if something within their remit is missing where you feel you may naturally fill a gap. But you see, this is a science. So getting into these big stores without a key reputation isn't easy. It does require a lot of work, but it's perfectly doable. You should also look at what type of promotions they like to run. Okay. Maybe they're offering um, introductory offers with money off. Maybe they're offering a discount on a third product. Whatever. Maybe they're offering a free makeup bag. Have a look and see what pattern there is there and what kind of promotions they like to run. You need to find out who the store buyer is in your category. And you can do this on LinkedIn. You can also do this by going into the store the key store, and asking the sales assistant. You want to check whether they use brand supplied point of sale or whether they have a very, very rigid um, map for how they are going to display and position products. And if this is a small store or gift store, um, I would always check their credit rating and make sure they can, if you're going to give credit, and I don't advise that you do, you could make sure that they've got a good credit rating. The next thing that you've got to consider is how to approach these buyers. And initially, it's with a great sales presentation. And that sales presentation is going to land on the desk of a buyer who probably receives 100 a week. Okay? So you have got to absolutely seduce them with this presentation. And you should open it with a captivating statement, something that absolutely makes your buyer read on. You should, you, having researched and understood what their mission is, you need to demonstrate synergy with their mission. You need to emphasize your specialness and your unique selling point. And you need to show, above all, commercial knowledge with stats and numbers. So your presentation needs to be a combination of storytelling and picture painting with hard professional numbers. Okay? You also need, it will also be very helpful if you can demonstrate your company's credibility. And if you're starting off, this is another thing that leaves people a little bit scared. Um, and there are various ways of doing this. So you should describe your company in terms of your team. That might be your mum and your teenage daughter, whatever. But you need to demonstrate that you're not running this business in a really haphazard one-person way that you are actually a company and that you're going to be sustainable and able to supply them and to scale with them. 
Um, and you should include in your presentation a call to action for a partnership. So you should actually, at the end of the presentation, tell them that you're going to contact them at such and such a date um, and that they should expect your call. Or you could tell them that you feel that you're just launching. This would be absolutely the perfect store to launch in. And if you're going to do that, you're going to have to put a bit of money into a marketing budget. Um, and just give them something so that that presentation doesn't just get to the bottom of the pile. You could offer them an exclusive deal in, in a particular product, whatever. There are lots of ways. I can't go into this in great depth now, but there are lots and lots of ways around this. So who is this buyer and how should you approach her? She's a bit like the woman in the picture in my experience. Um, now, the, the biggest mistake... Um, new brand owners make is to think that their presentation should be all about them. Okay, so they go in with this passion. They've been so close to their products for such a long time, trying to create them, um, the thinking behind them, the branding, all this stuff. Um, you, you, there is a tent, you would be forgiven to have the tendency to believe that the buyer doesn't actually exist. So the first thing to remember is that your buyer is a human being, just like you. So she, she's got a job that she's got to hang on to. And her success depends on identifying the next must-have brand. Now, her role, her job, like your job is to sell your products, her job is to ensure that her bosses get the best profits and that she is using reliable suppliers. And she's probably, uh, if, judging by most of the, the buyers that I've met and talked to, she's probably working under extreme stress and her, her time is extremely limited. So she not only has to buy product, but she also has to manage suppliers. So she wants to un know that you understand a fair bit about the supply chain. If she's going to work with you, that will make her life easier. She doesn't want to coax you along. She doesn't. They're, they're, they're a lot more helpful than they used to be because buyers now are have recognized the value of working with indie brands, but at the same time, time she doesn't want to feel that your inexperience is going to be an incredible drain on her time and she's also overwhelmed with pitches from new brands so you have to present your products in a way that she is going to remember okay so you'll probably she will probably on a first meeting you will probably be granted a maximum of 20 minutes and you should use that. She's already read your presentation, so she already knows about your brand. So what you need to do is pro focus primarily on what you have learned in your research about the store situation and not talk about your own situation. Well, to some degree you can, but really her, her mission, making her happy, is your job in that meeting. And one trick to do this is to use mirroring um, to, to understand how to deal with, with, with a buyer. And that is that if she, you mirror, you mirror how she behaves to some degree. So if your buyer is um, casual with you and asks you personal questions and is very friendly, uh, to a strong degree, you can relax and, and be the same. Now, if she is... Um, official perhaps she's having a bad day she asks you questions and wants snap answers give them to her don't try and win her around don't try and um um and perform and soften things because just take it at her pace um you need to show that you know her store like your own home and you need to show also that you understand the trends in the industry and you understand what she's trying to achieve and um, you can match that expectation and you can help her achieve her goals. You also need to know what deals you can offer. Again, we're back to that preparation, what discounts you can offer. Um, 
you need to know about your demographics as well. Not your demographics, I'm sorry, your logistics. You have to be confident that if you say you can deliver within a certain lead time that you actually can because you can do a lot more damage if you can't if, if you suddenly confronted with a buyer giving you a huge order that you know you can't commit to um, ask if you can deliver in stages uh, whatever but don't make make up a load of bullshit just because she thinks she wants to hear it be reliable be as good as your word you should talk to her about her customers. Um, having watched them, you'll know who they are. And again, demonstrate above all, demonstrate that you know her store well. You know what other brands she shares, she sells. Don't ever knock another brand. Um, if you know a little bit about the other brands that that she sells, then you can talk about that. But this is about her experience, not about your experience. So. I hope that there was some useful stuff on there for you. I'm going to